Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming in to see the first of uh, what we hope will be um, a yearly panel discussion um, at the CAVE conference. My name is Susan Gabriel. I am the director of the health program at the Community College in Baltimore County. Before we get into um, talking to our panel members, I wanted to relay a, uh, a conversation I heard about this morning that made me laugh. And, um, and I think one of the people on the panel was part of this conversation. But I guess last night there were a group of people when we went out for the dinner who were talking about the fact that our conference is taking place uh, in the hotel and we're two levels below the lobby. <laughs> So our goal before we finish is what all sessions will be at, at B1, and maybe we'll even have something in the lobby, which I think the reception tonight might be in the lobby. We might have made it up. Um, so um, I, I am so excited with the panel we were able to um, to present with you to, to you today, and I like to think of them as the Mount Rushmore of the <laughs> Somebody told me that I should have photoshopped a picture of Mount Rushmore and put the pictures up there. So if I ever use that line again, I will do that. Okay. So basically, the, the plan today is that um, I'm going to do a short introduction of each of our panelists who probably need little or no introduction. I will say that I'm including in each introduction a small tidbit that each of them gave me about themselves when they're not doing work in the field of acceleration. So you're going to learn a little bit about each of them. Uh, and then each of them is going to spend a few minutes just talking about where they've been and where they're going with respect to their individual work. And then we have some, I have some questions, but I'm also going to leave plenty of time for you to ask questions. And we have a microphone in the center that will be part of that. Okay, so let's meet our panelists. Uh, we'll start with Peter Adams. Peter Adams is Professor Emeritus from the Community College of Baltimore County. He is the creator and founder of the Accelerated Learning Program, and he was the director from the start in 2007 um, until his retirement from CCBC in 2014. Uh, Peter had a 36-year teaching career at CCBC and uh, now is a consultant and continues to speak widely about how working with individual schools and Complete College America and the Education Commission of the State. Okay, so here's Peter's book tidbit. Years ago, I introduced Peter to Sudoku, and, um, <laughs> and I also told him that there is an online site where you can play Sudoku matches against people from all over the world. Well, he has taken that by storm. Um, I play on it too, and there are 20 levels. I'm at level 8. He's at level 13. Uh, he is a Sudoku mentor. And he has an interesting username. If he ever discloses it to you, then you could play him in a match. With the so there you have it. That's what he's doing in his spare time. Retirement is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, next I'd like to introduce Katie Hearn. Katie Hearn is an English instructor from Chicago College and the co founder of the California Acceleration Project, which supports California's 112 separately governed community colleges. Her goal is to transfer our remediation and increase completion and equity. Her speaks nationally about integrated reading and writing, the movement to redesign developmental education, and instructional principles and practices for accelerated highways. Highways, yes. Okay, so here's Katie's fascinating tidbit. So she wrote that, um, quote, I know how to eat fire. So in my mind, I'm conjuring up a carnival with the fire eater, um, and I'm pretty sure the hotel will not want you to demonstrate that, but, um, but I have a feeling it has something to do with the fact that I've always felt she's a wonderful force, so I think that has something to do with that analogy. So, so we can maybe find out later how she knows that. Okay. Uh, next on our pirate panel, our pirate, is Myra Snell. She's a pirate. <laughs> she's a pirate. That's her, that's her little tidbit. She's a pirate. 
Uh, Myra is a professor of mathematics at Madonna's Don, 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 uh, College and is the co-founder of also the California Acceleration Project. In her role at the uh, at CAS, she's the math lead. She supported math faculty at 26 CAS California Community Colleges to develop and implement statistics pathways. For students in these pathways, completion of transfer level math has dramatically increased and achievement gaps have been significantly narrowed. Okay, so Myra's little interesting fact is that when she's not working, she can be found hanging out in her garden, communing with her chickens. <laughs> Imagine fresh eggs every morning in her house, and the, um, the lovely sound of chickens. All right, last but not least, Ruth. <laughs> I just heard a chicken sound, that was awesome. <laughs> now Myra goes right at home. <laughs> Okay, last but not least is Bruce Mandel. Bruce is the Vice President of Complete College America, a national nonprofit with a single mission to work with states to significantly increase the number of Americans with quality career certificates or college degrees and to close attainment gaps for traditionally underrepresented populations. Bruce is the former director of the Post-Secondary and Workforce Development Institute at the Education Commission of the State. The ECS. At ECS, he led Getting Past Go, a three-year Lumina Foundation for Education project to more effectively leverage investments in developmental education and to increase, increase college attainment. Bruce reports that when he is not trying to convince state leaders to reform remedial education, he's trying to teach teenagers how to effectively execute the hit and run with a runner at first base and no out. Okay, so no baseball, this is a tricky thing. Um, as, because he is a hitting coach for his son's high school baseball team. So, interesting, interesting. In fact, after he said this, Bruce and I had a long exchange about our favorite baseball teams and you know, how the twins do it. And it's interesting. Okay. Yeah, the twins. All right, so um, at this point, we're going to start. We'll just, we'll just go down the line. We'll start with Peter um, and have each of them just spend a few minutes just talking a little bit about um, what they've been doing and then we will uh, proceed to the question. Peter? So, in graduate school, my field was the American novel, and I thought that I would have a nice career teaching American literature, focusing on the novel for the next 30 or so years. <laughs> and I finally arrived, after years in the wilderness, with a real job at, at, at what was then Essex Community College in Baltimore, and right away learned that my primary job would be teaching basic writing. And I've, been, I, I've taught there for 36 years and actually never taught a course on American literature in 36 years. <laughs> now, I'm not sure I remember anything about American literature. <laughs> but I, 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 I was really startled to find that I, I embraced my new career. And, and in fact, I found the job of trying to figure out how to be successful with basic writers, how to help them move forward on their path to becoming truly effective writers in the world, uh, I found that to be much more intellectually challenging than Ernest Hemingway or Nathaniel Hawthorne. And so it, it was with no sense of loss that I ended up a teacher of basic writing, but some sense of frustration because Semester after semester, I would have the experience many of you have had of uh, finding only half my class was still attending by Thanksgiving. And in, at the end of every semester, I would always feel quite let down by the results I had produced that semester, but fairly certain that the next semester was going to be different. <laughs> and I managed to do that for 36 years. Um, finally, about uh, in, in the 1990s, I started thinking about this idea of what we were then calling mainstreaming basic writers into English 101. I wasn't sure how it would work, and, uh, but, but I, it seemed like it might work better than what we were doing. And by 2007, I had convinced four of my colleagues at uh, what was now called Community College of Baltimore County that we could actually um, propose trying that out with, uh, with our students, the, the, the program that turned out to be ALP. I never dreamed it would be as successful as it was. It's really been uh, just a, a, 
the, the perfect ending to a, to a career full of 36 years of frustration uh, to finally begin to make some progress. And um, I, I've worked with, I've met a number of you today and yesterday that, that I've met with at other conferences or I visited your school. And I, I have to say that experience of working with fellow teachers of basic writing all around the country and it's just warmed my, it gives me hope and it finally leads me and, and I think hope is something we all need these days. Uh, Mike Rose said this morning that he thinks we're at a crossroads uh, and I thought that was a, a really apt metaphor because it means there are two directions. If I know what a crossroads is, it seems like actually I'm thinking about a fork in the road. <laughs> but anyhow, I'm thinking there are two directions, but maybe there are three or four, and they aren't all positive. Um, all the attention, all the foundational support for innovation, uh, all the attention, attention to uh, assessment, all the attention to uh, who, who, what, whether developmental education is working or not, uh, could result in some terrible outcomes. I've been saying to people lately that it seems to me that developmental education is the place where the most marginalized students are taught by the most marginalized faculty in the most underfunded institutions. And they wonder why it hasn't worked as well as we want it to. Uh, and I think we have to struggle to change all of those things, both so that our students and ourselves are no longer marginalized, and so that funding that is needed to do a really good job of developmental education is provided. If we don't, I fear, I fear that those who really believe that not only does developmental education not belong in college, but developmental students don't belong in college, and that may be the pathway we go down. So I, I'm, despite the fact that I play Sudoku a lot, I'm still working hard to try to help all of you and myself figure out how we can do this better. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't go over. <laughs> I would tie my um, work in accelerated developmental education back to a phone conversation with Myra. We were working together on a previous grant. And uh, she had developed the precept course and this accelerated uh, single semester precept course. And she was trying to explain to me that, you know, no, uh, that the inevitable attrition that happens as we do a layered approach to remediation. She was trying to explain that to me. And I was really sure that, but no, but my learning community, though, because that's what I was working on at the time, was learning community that was getting better results, like 10% point higher completion of whatever. Um, but I was sure that, and she's like, okay, she finally said, take out your calculator. She <laughs> was like, okay, all right, so then let's take out your calculator. But so what if you got that first course up to 80% passing? And what if you did the next, and then 80%? And she had me walk through it, and I, and she's on the phone, and I'm at a very messy desk, and, and I, I got, and then it was like, okay, equal, so multiply 70% of 70% of 70% five times. What do you, and what if you get to 80% of me? And, and I just was like, oh my god, <laughs> is that right? Like, is that, is that really true? Like, I just, you know, and, and then it was, and it's sort of, that's the moment I became an evangelist. Like, <laughs> that's the moment where I was like, oh my god, the way we've done developmental education is fundamentally broken. Fundamentally broken. And we need to tell everyone, like, we need to, this is, this is so, and that's what we've been doing sort of since uh, fall 2009, and sort of, the, you know, conference presentations and, you know, or we're getting invitations to speak in other Missouri, Arkansas, like, you know, lots of not glamorous work, um, but, um, but this is sort of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and it's just, the travel is like on the plane into a hotel conference room with no windows back on the plane, you know, sort of, but it just feels so urgent, like there's just the clarity around the entire structure of what we've been doing is broken. And we need to tell everyone because we can do better by our students. And students, and then there's the, the counterpoint of, and students are more capable than we've been giving them credit for. You know, and so those two things combined have really, you know, sort of driven me in the last five years of working with Myra and supporting 
change in our system, which is huge and sprawling, and there's no one person in charge who can just say, that's broken, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> you had to convince colleges, college by college, a few sections at a time, it's been completely grassroots mobilization, faculty to faculty. Um, and it's producing really amazing results, and it's, we have a, you know, a, just a network of incredibly passionate, committed faculty leaders across the state who are making change locally. Um, and and it's, so it's, it's really been very satisfying. And, and then we're connected to this network nationally and people doing the same thing. So it's just been, um, I feel very fortunate to be part of it. Thank you, Gay. Margaret? Um, okay, so I'm the math side of the house in the California Acceleration Project. And I'm just curious if you're a math person in the room, could you raise your hand? Okay, so I'd like to just sort of look around at how few and brave <laughs> these few math people are. Thank you for joining us. I want to just say a few comments as in the spirit of what Peter had talked about and how I came to the place that I am in my thinking and my work with Katie. Um, when I first started my very first semester of teaching at the community college where I've now been for 23 years, I had just graduated um, in the master's pure mathematics program at the University of California in Berkeley. And I was in shock my first year teaching at the community college. I really was. I was shell shocked and I was teaching arithmetic and elementary algebra and applied calculus course. And my training had been in pure mathematics, which has no application really at the point level, you know. Um, so I, that semester, failed 60% of my arithmetic students. And I worked hard. I was trying. I was really trying. And I couldn't, it was going around trying to get help, trying to figure out why I couldn't help these students learn what I viewed as really fundamentally basic mathematics. And at the end of that year, I went to an award ceremony that was given at the college, and the students, and I'm not talking about one or two, I'm talking about many of the students that I had given big, fat Fs to in arithmetic, were winning awards, statewide awards in journalism, local awards in poetry, one of them had participated in the Grammy um, music recording thing, and I just suddenly realized that I had sat through 90 hours of instruction with this group of students and I knew absolutely nothing about them. I had no idea of their capacity and I had just stamped them as a you can't do arithmetic, which basically meant they were not going to go anywhere educationally, right? They were done unless they could go through and pass that course eventually. So that was sort of the first epiphany that I had that set me on this long road. And I'm going to say some things, and I hope, I think I know a lot of the math people in the audience, so I know you won't be offended by my comments. Um, but I, I feel like I have spent the last 23 years of my life really deeply thinking about math education and what it means, and wondering why such a large percentage of our population in the United States identifies themselves as, I can't do math, I'm not a math person. Why is that? And I actually think that lands solidly in the lack of the way that we teach mathematics in the United States. So I just want to say to English people in the room, it's not that you can't do it, it's that it's, 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 I'm serious. So, and you know, I meet every, you know, it's like you go to, every time I meet somebody new and I tell them I'm a math teacher, you hear the horror stories, right, of how they never could do math and they, they have all this self blame and shame around it, or they're sort of like, and it's not useful anyway. <laughs> but I just want to say that um, I have worked really hard in the last 20 years of rethinking curriculum and pedagogy and mathematics, and I mean, spent a lot of years rethinking algebra remediation. And then realized before I started working with Katie, I had this stupidity that I had worked for um, three years on a Title III multi-million dollar grant at my college, and we, our grant goals were to increase our elementary and intermediate algebra course success rates by 10 percent. You have grant goals like this, right? And at the time, we had no way of getting pipeline research. So I actually, at the end of the grant, we met all of our grant goals, and we did phenomenal work in professional development learning outcomes assessment, we integrated counseling into classes, we have invented tutoring, we implemented new placement structures, we just did everything. I was so proud of that work. But at the end of that grant, I asked our institutional research office 
to tell me the percentage of students who started in elementary algebra that completed a transferable math course during the, the tenure of that grant for three years. It took me six months to get that research back. And at the end of that, it was 17%. I was absolutely devastated. And I went through a series of just thought games with myself saying, well, what if we've been able to get our course success rates up to 75%? What would that completion rate have looked like? And I pretty quickly realized that things that we all know at this point, right? But for me, it was truly a stupidity, one of these things where I just thought, if we don't change the structure of this sequence, there's no way that we can have a completion rate that we're proud of. The other stupidities that I had that are very humorous and almost embarrassing for me to talk about now, but at the time they really were ground shaking for me and nobody was talking about them, was that most of our students are not STEM majors. I hate to break that to you, but <laughs> most of them are not going to go into math and into field. So we have this thing that we have a long structure that nobody gets out of, inevitable attrition, We've got, we're preparing everybody in our developmental sequences or algebra-based remediation to go into calculus, and most of them will never take that course. I mean, how insane is this, right? But to change this, and why I ask the math people to raise their hands, is that to change this is questioning deep things in mathematics, right? Because we are saying, if most students are not going to take calculus, they're taking statistics, right? And what is the preparation that's needed for statistics? It's not algebra, oh, right? Algebra is not a foundational skill that is required for you to function as an educated human being. I, this is heresy right now. Right? <laughs> so those, those things, the places that the series of stupidities led me, and I think now, like Katie and I, when we first started moving around the state talking about this stuff, we had a very hard time getting people to understand attrition in the pipeline. We, we were unsuccessful, I think, our first four or five presentations around that, and we kept inventing the activities for people to do and trying to get that point across. But now when I move around the state and around the nation, this is just, everybody knows that, right? It's just a dummy, quit talking about it, we get it. So that's an evidence, I think, of how far we've come, right? In about five years, how far the field really has moved. And in math education, this rethinking about what are the foundational skills, what are the quantitative reasoning that every educated person should have, and trying to let go of a lot of the symbolic algebra work we're doing with, with um, students who are not in math intensive majors and focusing on quantitative reasoning is a very hard road, right, for us to walk as math education. Um, and what I think is fundamentally important. And so I tell you, I come to these conferences and I almost go into a wondering if I am doing the right thing because it is so hard, right? The, the, there's so few math faculty here. The English faculty, what they're doing sort of resonates in their soul and who they are as English people. <laughs> and math people are saying, I want you to become something new, right? And it, it really isn't tapping into the things that they have been trained in or that I was trained in. So um, what I want to say is, is in, in closing is that I think where we're headed in English folks, I don't need to put this in your lap, but these are your students that are getting stuck in our developmental math sequence. These are the people who are going to be the future, you know, journalists, right, creative writers, the musicians, the artists, the people who are interested in studying criminal justice. These are your people that are getting stuck right in my courses. And I need English people to stand up and say, it is not the purview of the math department to determine right, what developmental education means in mathematics. This is a general education issue, and we need to own it right, as faculty across the discipline. So because most of your English <laughs> Department, you know, you don't have standing on this issue. This is a general education issue, okay? So that's what I thought. Thank you, Byron. And last but not least, Bruce, thank you. Thanks, Susan. Uh, 
First of all, it's a pleasure to be with all of you and faculty members. Uh, I'm not often in rooms with just with mostly faculty members, so it's a pleasure to be with you and to enter into a conversation with you today. Those of you who are familiar with Complete College of America, we have a bit of a reputation of being somewhat strident about what we think needs to happen in the world of remediation and other issues related to college completion. We're no way. <laughs> Um, so we have a fairly straightforward point of view about it, and it's largely in alignment with the folks up here and many of you in the room today about the need to obviously end the attrition points that exist and as much as possible get students into college level courses as quickly as we can and provide them support in those courses. We like to use the term prerequisites. Um, and so we go around the country talking to faculty, but largely state level leaders, policy makers, occasionally a piece of that legislation gets introduced. And out of the woodwork comes faculty and other organizations that sort of say we can't do this, we're not ready for this, um, it's just not something that's going to work, despite the fact that we have a lot of evidence to suggest otherwise. And of course, speaking to Myra's point about the evidence and where, how far we've come on this issue, I started this work 10 years ago working with the state of Tennessee um, and the Tennessee Board of Regents on how to reform developmental education. At that point, we had very little understanding of how to solve the problem. We, you know, we, we made some changes, and I think they were incremental changes um, to make some improvements. But there was no question, there wasn't a clarity about how to go about this in a way that I think exists today. Um, and here's the thing that I think is a little interesting and maybe a, a wee bit ironic, is that um, the reason that CCA can say what it says and does what it does, uh, and sometimes rankle folks in the process is not because we stand in front of the room and make uh, assessments based on a lack of understanding of what can or has been done or sort of being sort of you know postulating about the world it's because we have seen evidence of success about how and what can be done to improve the success of students uh, through these approaches and uh, frankly um, ironically it's because of work of faculty. It is because of the work of these three and others and some of you in the room that have been able to take this on, have cracked this nut, and are getting results that are astronomical. I mean, we're not talking five or ten percent improvements in success, we're talking about five and six fold improvements in success. And when you see that, you have to pay attention. And that is sort of red meat for an organization like CCA because we want to tell that story. And we don't want it to be done, we don't want to see these results in isolation. So that there's only a handful of students here and a handful of students there that are benefiting from the work of individual faculty. Um, and so actually I'm gonna I'm gonna amend Susan the fact that I am on the Mount Washington. Um, I think that I'm one of the people trying to chisel it. Okay. To show these three, and hopefully dozens and hundreds and thousands more who are doing this work and getting the results that these folks are getting and many of you are getting so that millions of students ultimately are benefiting from it and getting the results they get they need, getting through college level courses and ultimately achieving their goals. That's what I'm trying to do and I, and I want to applaud all of you for the work that you're doing on that front because that is what's exciting. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I have a, a few questions that I um, that I want to ask the panelists, and I'm going to ask a question, and whoever might want to respond to it is fine. Hopefully, somebody will, um, and then we will get to your questions. So be thinking about what you would like to talk about. I'm going to try to cover the topics I think we're most interested in knowing your ideas about. So my first question is, what do you know now that you wish you had known when you started working in acceleration? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> okay. There are two things that I would say I know now that I didn't know then. One was the importance of faculty development. I, for the first three years of ALP, we, we kept looking around for some experts on ALP to bring in to teach us how to do it. And then we realized we were going to have to figure it out for ourselves. And the second thing, and this is one on which I have locked horns with Complete College America on numerous occasions, and, and that was on the emphasis of scaling up and pilots don't work and we have to we have to do this. I fought them tooth and nail for years on this issue. I said you don't know how complex the problem is. You don't know what what, what a huge ship we're trying to turn. And I now see 
now that we're in our eighth year of ALP, at the mothership of ALP, <laughs> now that we're in the eighth year, and just over half of the students who could be in ALP are, are in ALP at our school. I see how hard it is to scale up, and I think about how many hundreds of students every semester for the, for the past eight years have not been successful in college and are now working at McDonald's or somewhere with the equivalent because we couldn't get our act together to move it fast enough. Now we didn't know any better in those days. We were we, we thought we were right about scaling slow, starting slow and building it up. But I I would say the thing I've learned now and the new advice I give to everybody I work with is try do do what North Arkansas Community College did. They, that's the Razor Back State. They went whole hog and 100% scale up the first year. Um, more, many schools are now beginning to see it as a two-year plan. All right, we'll run a limited number of sections for two years with the goal that in the third year, we'll, that, that'll be the end of uh, scaling. We'll, we'll be 100% of whatever form of acceleration we're going to do. So the, learning that lesson about scaling up, how hard it is, how many obstacles, how many people you have to convince to get them on board has, has been an eye-opener to me and you could pass my apologies to Stan Jones about that. Anyone else want to answer that question? I, I do. Yeah. I was thinking about the Arkansas Community College Board because I think that they have a we were clear from the beginning that the more uh, layers you add and the more exit points through which you could lose your students, the fewer students will complete. Like we were clear about that from that first phone call. Myra was clear before me. She, I got it with the calculator. Um, but but it, in, in terms of the full manifestation of what that might look like, the recent literature in the last five years, of some of it led by John Hess around the potential for placement reform and how that connects into the work. So so we weren't asking. We were asking if they're in that ed, what should we provide to them? What kind of instruction? What kind of structures, pedagogy? But we weren't asking should they have been there? And that's a question that has become very clear in the last year or so that I wish had become more clear sooner so that we could have made more impact. I'm just, I'm so just, it's like the, the problem is so urgent and, and um, the stakes so high for our students that anything that delays it is a source of angst for me. Um, and then the other thing that I wish that we had been clearer about from the outset were the equity implications of this and the disproportionate placement of students of color into remediation and then into multiple levels of remediation and how screwed they are by that. And that those are our structures and our policies and the way that we are creating inequality with those. I wish that we had been clear about that and sort of more actively working. I think a lot of the equity stuff has been happening over here and the acceleration stuff has been happening over here and I I want those two worlds to come together more. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I'm just gonna reiterate, I think Katie and I are in exactly the same place about things we wish we had understood sooner. Mm -hmm. um, but I will just say if you're getting started, that placement is the place to start, right? And I hope everybody's clear about that. I also think it is frankly the easiest place to start. So if you weigh making a placement decision versus training all of your faculty and redefining all of your courses, placement is the easy lift <laughs> and it's also the most powerful lever. So I think if Katie and I had understood that earlier, um, we would have designed you know, things quite differently in the past. Um, but you know, we can hear a lot more about that tomorrow with John Tech. You know, it was very exciting work my mind and played around placement issues and it has huge equity implications. Thank you. I would only say that when we first started, it was indeed from the assumption that these students, um, that, that the problem was still focused largely on students and their ability to learn and not understanding that it's a structural issue, fundamentally structural design. And so that when we came to the conclusion that really at the end of the day, and I think this was a point where once again, you know, this is everybody's business is to see that students are successful. And I think that's where we're going. We're ultimately talking about um, investing energy and effort into seeing students get through gateway courses and into programs of study. And not seeing it as an isolated exercise of what are we doing in the media. No, it's about college success and college completion. And that that's where we have to start the conversation and work our way back from there. That's not where I started. 
and I'm hoping that for other people are, are heading, is understanding its essential nature uh, uh, to be supporting. If a student is admitted to college, we should treat them like a college student and not admit them to remediation. We should be remediating them and serving their needs as best that we can and encouraging their success at that level. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next topic has to do with um, top-down mandates with respect to uh, the acceleration initiatives around the country. For many faculty members, the idea of something coming from a legislator um, and being told what to do is not um, is viewed very negatively. Um, in your experience, what are the advantages and the disadvantages of developmental education reform programs stemming from political entities outside academia? Okay. <laughs> you want to go? Over? No. Yeah. I, 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 and then, so, I have nothing to say about that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. this question. So, California, we don't have that option. There's like, sometimes I have been desperate for a grown up to just say, we're not doing that. That's no, we're not doing that anymore. It's very clear that it's broken. But we don't have, our system is not set up that way. It's completely decentralized with local control, so we've had to go college by college, section by section. And that's slow, and, and, and I'm, uh, I'm impatient uh, on behalf of our students. I'm impatient. Um, so that's the downside of not having any top down, you know, like literally no top down anything. Whereas in states like Colorado, supported by organizations like CCA, they can take the ideas of what we've learned and become clear about in California, and then it's just statewide as of fall 2013, that it's, or the state of Virginia. Massive changes to placement, correct models, single semester remediation, and grade reading and writing statewide. That's what they do now. And I feel like, oh, a little bit of top down might really <laughs> might, you know, so it's a strange thing for me to say as a faculty member that I, I, it, I it, you know, I don't hate the idea of a top down when I see the needs are so urgent and the pace of change is slow. I'd like to start by reiterating the point Bruce made in his opening comments, and that is that there is a perception, as I travel around the country, and I suspect Myra and, and Katie have experienced the same thing, that people perceive our various forms of acceleration as top-down mandates in their states. And I just want to make sure everybody in this room realizes that both the California acceleration model and the ALB model originated with faculty, with us, and, and, and with my colleagues in my English department at the Community College of Baltimore County. So they weren't something thought out by Bill and Melinda, or Bruce and Stan. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and number two, I want to just tell a quick little story of something that happened in Connecticut, uh, where there was some state legislative action by Senator Beth by the Public Law 1240. And, uh, Susan and I went up, we had some money left over in a grant from Kresge, and uh, I, I, when I heard that Senator Bai had introduced this legislation that the Inside Higher Ed headlined as abolishing developmental ed in Connecticut, I, I called up a friend of mine who's a college president there, and I said, Gina, who, who is Senator Bai, and why, why in the world is she doing this? And she said, Peter, you're not going to believe this, but Beth Bai went to a talk you gave in Austin, Texas, and she thinks she's doing what you want her to do. <laughs> so I had a huge sense of guilt towards the state of Connecticut. So we took our little leftover money, and we, we, it turned out that the legislation, what, when, when people call it the abolishing development, they meant abolishing their traditional model and replacing it with something like a co-requisite model. So we, offer to take, take on six colleges in Connecticut and help them develop and do the faculty development for uh, an ALP program. And we worked at those six colleges for about uh, a little over a year, I think. We, every time we would meet, uh, we would do a, a sort of ritualistic chanting against that body. <laughs> but I said to those faculty members at one point, I said, I, I really want to ask you a question I'd like you to think about. And that is, as, as a lifelong faculty member, I, I don't like top-down mandates, especially from state legislatures, but even from my department head sometimes. I don't like it. But what is the correct faculty response 
When a mandate comes down from the legislature or the Board of Regents or the Board of Trustees or the college president, and it's really a good idea, then what are we to do as faculty? And I think for us to say, we weren't consulted, this is a, whoever made this up doesn't, has never been in the classroom, and therefore we're going to dig in our heels and continue to do something that clearly isn't working with our students is a huge mistake. At the end of that year or so with those uh, faculty members in Connecticut, I asked them, I said, all right, go forth and multiply. <laughs> but it, what do you think now of Public Law 1240? And they told me that they, they still thought it was a terrible piece of legislation, badly executed, badly communicated, and that they never would have been doing what they were doing today if it hadn't passed. Sometimes we need some top-down pressure to, to get the job done. So here, here's my thoughts on this, is, you know, Complete Health America is not adverse to the notion that a piece of legislation that a, a legislator like that by or others might introduce that tackles this issue. Is it the preferred way or the only way that we think change can happen? Absolutely not. We think that there are obviously many ways that it can be, this work can be scaled. It can be done at the system level. Um, it can be done through a consortium of colleges that commit themselves to that objective, and we can get there in many different ways. However, I just want to put it out there, um, and um, you know, if you're going to continue to get these kind of results, people are going to take notice. And it's not often in the life of a policymaker that you can see something, that you can do something about, and you can say the evidence is very clear that that is going to work. They're going to want to do something about it. So I don't think we're you know, it's going to be it's going to be part of the conversation for quite some time. In fact, it's funny. I don't know if many of you um, uh, saw this last week. President Obama was on the podcast. What WTF? WTF? I'm not going to say you know that name. <laughs> With Mark Maron. I don't know if you listened to that. It's crazy, but it's crazy that he was on it. But uh, they asked him. Mark Maron asked him that specific question. The president said, "You know, that is my job." as a politician, as an elected official, is that when I find out that there's something that works, there's evidence behind it that it works, the facts stand up to that test, why wouldn't I want to see that happen for everybody instead of in an individual school here or an individual institution there? And he was talking about early childhood education um, and why is it we don't have universal you know, child, early childhood education in this country? Well, I could argue exactly the same thing given the evidence that we're seeing coming out of the institutions that are doing this work. It doesn't make any sense. So uh, there is a point where absolutely, as faculty members, if indeed your legislator decides to introduce a fifth piece of legislation, my piece of advice is don't fight it, cooperate, collaborate, inform, educate, hopefully get that legislation in a, in a place where it can be, or if, or if nothing else, to say, hey, give us a chance to do this on our own first, and if we, if we can't get it done, then we'll, then we'll do it. And in fact, there's a lot of states where that happened. West Virginia, which is going to scale on co-requisite remediation for all their community colleges. They're getting amazing results after one year. It was the threat of legislation that moved them into action. So if there's a shot across your bow and you do nothing about it, then expect another shot to be coming. And so I think that's the challenge we have. The success that we're having is going to only get more attention. And so the question is how do you respond to it? And I think Peter's point is exactly right. Take advantage of the opportunity to do it and try to shape it rather than resist it. Um, and hopefully that will get the results that we want without sort of the, the negative consequences that sometimes come with it. Okay, thank you. Now in the interest of time, I want to make sure there's time for you all to ask some questions too. I'm going to ask one more question, which um, considering the news of last week and the demise of the compass test, that, uh, yeah, the um, uh, I want to just bring up the placement issue and ask the panelists um, what are your thoughts and advice about placement um, and we'll just do a, a short discussion and then we'll get to your questions. So I'm going to actually disagree a little bit with Myra on the placement question, only insofar as my concern with starting with placement is that's where it ends. Um, and you feel like, okay, we, we moved the cut store. Good work, everyone. Let's go back to our jobs. I mean, I think that at the end of the day, you've got to first look at how you're redesigning the support instruction. And I think the real great work is, of course, the way we've redesigned how we're, 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 we're teaching students and the models that we've done. And then have placement be done in service of that objective, right? So I think that, I will agree with Myron if we, agree, we can agree with that compromise, right? Which is, if you're not going to redesign the instructional model, 
then you're then I don't you shouldn't waste the time on placement. But if you're committed to redesigning what you're doing to support students, then okay, that can be part of the conversation. I think that's probably fair to say. Um, and I think it's got to be about not about sorting students, right? If you're redesigning your placement, like I said, moving the cut scores so that or, or using multiple measures because you're going to feel better at night, sleeping better at night, that you're putting students in the right place. Well, the evidence is really not that strong, even with GPA that is, per is a perfect measure. So like I said, start with how you intend to instruct and serve students first with the goals that I think that this conference is espouses. And then think about that as a frame by which you look at, at placement. That's, I think, the critical thing that I would bring to this. Um, and, uh, and hope that, you know, if whatever system you design is about supporting success in college level courses or in the types of models that you're hearing about here. Okay. Anyone else? I agree with all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and, and when I'm thinking, rethinking placement, it's always placement into what, right? And when I listen to CCA um, presentations, one of the beautiful visions that I come away with when I listen to Bruce is that it wouldn't it be lovely if the worst thing that can happen to a student after going through a placement process is that they were placed into a transfer level course with extra support. You know, so you either get placed into transfer or you get placed into transfer with support. So that the placement process was used as a way to identify the support that people needed, as opposed to putting them into structures that we know are, you know, it's inevitable that they won't get out. So I think when I'm saying replace, rethink placement, I'm really thinking about, in some ways, that essentially doing away with multi-tier placement. You, know, you either are college ready, or we think you might not be. And if you're not, if we don't think you're college ready. Let's try you in a college level course with extra support and what would that look like, right? And then if we really, if your faculty won't buy into that, I think the bottom line should be no more than one semester remediation, right? And that that should be really redesigned and carefully thought about based on student pathways. So yeah, this placement is, is remediation redesign and a questioning of what remediation really means. I would say a couple of other kind of big picture takeaways on the placement thing is that in math, first ask, what do you want to study? <laughs> and if the answer is not a calculus-based major, you know, that's a 20%-ish of uh, pathways, then we shouldn't be using algebra-based testing and remediation as a block on your college level course. Like, that's just like one big simple move that makes so complete sense that it's almost like, how are we not doing that? How are we testing people on algebra skills that are irrelevant to success in statistics, and then if they can't do those things that are irrelevant, we don't want them in statistics. Why don't we use Latin? Why don't we use yoga? <laughs> like, they're completely irrelevant to success in the course, why is it blocking X or the course? Sure. Um, so because, because we are all relinquished control, so because we do I don't know math, math people need to decide. It's like that's not rational. That's that's this we need to, this is where we need to all non math people need to say no, no. <laughs> if, if I'm placed three levels below and I have graduate degrees, there's a there's we're not defining this right. <laughs> you know? If I can't do these things then that there's something wrong with the placement. And then and then one more thing. <laughs> uh oh. I think this is gonna happen. Thank you. <laughs> That's the starting point too, is that we are massively underplacing students in germination, and the research is very clear about that. And so just letting more students give college presentations, just, just letting more students in without doing any multiple measures or fancy moves or changes to instruction or anything, just let more students in. And they tripled the completion of African American completion of college English within one year, like institution-wide. So, so they, these are, I, I, I would say, even if you can't do big changes to instruction integrity, it's still work. It's still that change is still going to make a difference in students' lives. Um, okay, really quickly. I, I I agree with everything Myron and Katie said and Bruce about uh, that placement issue. And I I was reminded again of, of uh, Mike Rose's metaphor about the crossroads this morning. I think we're at a crossroads on assessment in this country, and we, many of us were very uh, excited to hear of the demise of the compass test uh, a few days ago. I got an email this morning announcing a new test 
that will replace Compass being produced by McCann Associates and it marries up perfectly with the Compass and, it, and it's going to involve, in, for the English folks, uh, computer created uh, essays. So I, I, we haven't won that battle yet and I, 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 I think it's not clear what direction we're going in this crossroads and that we, those of us who know where we want to go, need to continue to be vigilant. Okay. All right, so we have some time for questions. If you would like to ask a question, you may come up to the microphone here in the center aisle. Thank you. Mark McCulloch, Chief Academic Officer at CCBC. So I want to go back to the question about mandates from above, especially from the state government. And um, I'm absolutely in favor of uh, mandates from above when they're the right mandate. Um, so that, for example, in Maryland, I would be uh, very happy if our state legislature would mandate a common numbering system for us and for the state college system. That will never come about spontaneously by faculty groups. It will never come about spontaneously by college presidents. It would have to be mandated by the state. One of the things that uh, we've been struggling with is a state mandate that we had on the books in Maryland for a number of years. And this is one example I'll give you of a state mandate that causes terrible problems is that it is mandated by Maryland state law, and it may change this week. It is mandated by Maryland state law that for non for all students taking any transfer of math class, no matter what it is, that the highest level of remediation must be intermediate algebra. Okay. So that's a state mandate. It's not, believe me, all the chief academic officers at all the 16 community colleges in Maryland have said for the last seven years that we want that change, but it has never been changed because it's a state mandate. And there have been a number of good things that have been, you know, we had a law passed two years ago in Maryland, uh, SB 740, that I think was on balance a good law and did good things for the state. But if you look at it, I think you can find similar examples in other states, episodically, state by state in some cases. But what I really see when I look around at the 50 states is a patchwork that varies from year to year, but it may be that they drift along and you know, do something pretty good that year, but then three years later, a new government comes into the state and slashes funding drastically and wrecks everything that's been done. So I would actually like to ask the panelists to talk very specifically about the funding question, because I'm quite sure how the three people on our left would feel about this, but I want to know how Bruce would feel about this. Would you be in support of saying that at the very least, the funding that we have now ought to continue, and in fact, if we're going to carry out these reform methods, for example, multiple measures, which cost a lot of money to do the right way, in my opinion, um, should we have a significant in increase in funding for community colleges to carry out these kinds of reforms? So, and we obviously, are not opposed to additional resources being found in the system in a way that's going to appropriately impact the, the results that we think we need to have. And, and you know, one of the five things that we work on uh, at Complete College America, is probably maybe you know slightly below the other four, is a performance and outcome-based funding. We believe that if an institution can show and demonstrate results and get resourced and funded and supported, but by uh, to achieve those results, then we should be resourcing those institutions. And I think that we're finding in states like Ohio and Indiana and other places, those types of models, I think, are pretty compelling because of the, of the changes that started on the ground and the opportunity to generate resources from it. And so, you know, likewise, I also think that if we can find resources, obviously, to help upstart some of these efforts, that would be fantastic. And just throwing money at the problem hasn't necessarily been the key to the solution, right? It's, it's about how you construct the resources to ensure that they're properly utilized towards the objective. So we have no, no problem with, with more resources in the system. I think the question is how do we make sure that they're going to get the results that we desire. And I think things like outcome-based funding are, once again, there. It's a fact of life. There, there are over 20 states right now, I think, is a part of that equation. And I hope it, 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 it enables a more productive dialogue between the state and institutions about how do we resource higher education in the future. Because one way I think, I think about it is, if you have an outcome-based funding system and they say, uh, we're going to cut funding to higher education, then higher education can say, well, your funding is non-performance, so you're just going to get less of this, just so you know that, right? So because of that cut, now we're going to get, you're going to get less results because that's what your funding is for, is results. So if you want to cut resources, then you're going to get lower results. 
I think that provides a little bit more leverage for institutions in the long run. I'm not saying it's a panacea by any means, um, but I think that's where we're at, and hopefully institutions can use that to their advantage. Okay, let's go to the next question, please. Hi, Kendra Lawson from City College of Francisco and Mass. And I have heard a lot of really good things about um, sort of downplaying the, the importance of algebra, especially for non stem majors, and uh, a lot of the reform of the pre test classes. And those seem very lovely. And I, I um, can't help thinking about the STEM majors or the wannabe STEM majors who still have awful algebra classes to get to. <laughs> and, um, and, and in addition, you know, maybe these people who take the, the precepts class and go, wow, math is actually really cool and I can do it. Maybe I want to, maybe I want to do a STEM major. And I, I wonder the extent to which you have um, addressed this question of allowing students, giving students a, an option to, to jump into another path or to have a better calculus-centered path. So I'll just say very quickly that I think the solution there is again acceleration. So if a student is moving out of one path, and it's not just a math, if they change from a journalism major into an engineering major, they're going to have to redo all their science courses and everything. So this is a major shift, right? Um, but I think there needs to be acceleration in the algebra pathway. So that's one. So that, that if they change majors, they can step by back by even more than a semester. It might be a pretty intensive semester, right? Um, I think the second thing is that there's been 15 years of beautiful work done on algebra um, reform. And I think just in a couple of words, I think that there's a beautiful literature on that. There's a lot of nice curriculum out there. And it is really about modeling. So instead of looking at algebra as a set of procedural skills that are, that are you know, discrete and disconnected, decontextualized, you look at it as a way of modeling the world. And, and so I think that's pretty powerful. Could you cite one or two examples of where we might go and to look for that? I can send you some great materials from my college that are around modeling perspective for algebra. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more. Perfect. My name is Leah. I'm from one of your dismal places. I'm at Well Pelto, but I'm from Arkansas and teach in Missouri. <laughs> institution for 22 years and this came home to me 20 years ago when one of my students said to me why when I don't have to take college algebra for my degree program it's all of my developmental math preparing me for college algebra and I stepped back and went holy crap she's right um, and for 22 years those 20 years actually I've been on a mission over that and so I love my math department. They're wonderful people. They feel very passionate about what they do. They care about students. But they have a huge blind spot. Right. And I'm the chair of the curriculum committee, so give me advice on how to do what you recommend. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know it's got to happen. Are you going to be at the mixer tonight? Um, I can't be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think just, you know, talking to math folks, um, I, I don't know that I can summarize that quickly, but I have a lot of ideas on that. So let's just, okay. that's And I, I think, and that one thing I add is that a state that has no, no one in charge is going to issue a top down mandate. What California has done is provide funding to make skills initiatives, and now hopefully another $60 million tied to acceleration related. Uh, transformation of basic skills. So, so there's there's funding, and then we have created grassroots, peer-led professional development networks that support faculty to do the incredibly difficult work of change. And I, I do think that in top-down states, that is often a missing piece. And so I'm, I'm sort of like I think that what we've done here around really the, the faculty own it, we create it, we lead it, we you know. Um, but then if we have a colleague who's you know, curmudgeon and doesn't want to do it, they often have veto power, and so our students are held hostage to that. Well, um, we've tried everything. We've tried to subvert the ground, bring them to conferences. We sat with our math department chair in Baltimore. So I'm like, wasn't that cool what we heard? That's pretty interesting. We can't do that. Yeah. Um, we tried to top down mandate when the chancellor said, got to do something different. 